Okay, sorry for being muted. Um, now for some live coding to do some of these things in Haskell. Um, this file that I've got open on the left half of the screen is a literate Haskell file. So the default, like the intro text above, is a comment. Everything is a comment unless you write begin code, end code, uh, between which there is some Haskell. So uh, here is a Haskell module called Live1 2022, imports the ratio module and tests by writing a rational number R, which is three halves. So for some reason, the percent sign is used rather confusingly, perhaps, uh, to denote ratios in Haskell. So, and here I define the little function f. Uh, I could define this function as f parentheses f x, but I don't need to. So the default in Haskell is if there is a function name and an argument name, that is a function application. And I'm not sure why this one is moving, trying to tell me that something is going on. Okay. Um, so we'll get to uh, the, the questions asked uh, during the break, uh, but first let's just try this right-hand side, which is the interpreter, the GHCI interpreter. So if I type R or F of R here, maybe this should be a bit bigger, uh, then I will get, well, nine fourths, <laughs> nine quarters. Uh, so the function F here, you might wonder what type it has, because it doesn't say, and um, I will get back to the all B to Bs later. Let's move it a bit further down um, because I first want to show that I can give functions different types here. So I can choose the type integer to integer, which is a valid type for F. So F1 here, for example, I can apply it to 1738 and square that, or I can apply it to two, which is easier to check that it does it correctly. And if I ask for the type of F1, it will say integer to integer. Uh, I cannot apply F1 to R. Then it will complain over left here. It says couldn't match ratio integer with integer. And well, that's because I declared it. I told the interpreter that this expects an integer as an argument, even though it's defined to just square the argument, which could be done also for a rational number. But it's worth noting that internally in the computer's memory, the representation for an integer and for a rational number are completely dis different, disjoint. So the types are really to keep track of what kind of data we've got. And it could do completely different things in these cases. Uh, F2 is another typing of the same F. So F2, uh, I can apply to uh, 2.5, for example, it gets 6.25. I can apply it to pi uh, to square, get pi squared. This I, and But I cannot apply F2 to R. That would also, again, be a problem that ratio integer is not the same as float. Uh, on the other hand, the third example, F3, I can apply to R, but I cannot apply it to, um, say, 3.4. Well, oh, okay, sorry. Um, there is an automatic conversion in Haskell for literals. So if I write a number like 3.4, it actually treats it at 34 tenths. And that's then simplified and squared to 289 25ths. So I can apply it uh, to numbers, uh, to rational numbers written as floating point numbers. Okay. So all of those are examples of the type of F, but the actual type of it is a polymorphic type. So it's A to A. So the argument and the result are the same type. And then there is a restriction, a constraint here, saying that A has to be a numeric type. So it can't be anything. I, for example, I cannot apply F to the string hello. That will be a complaint. Well, actually, the complaint is just saying that, well, it doesn't know how to do numerics on lists of characters. You could define what numerics should mean for list of characters. It probably would not be a good idea, but there is nothing stopping you in Haskell from providing such an instance. 
Okay, those were some examples, very simple examples. And I wanted to get back to what we were do talking about just before the break. So we had this question of uh, all values of type B to B, well, bool to bool. So I thought, okay, let's, let's make a list of those values. So the list syntax has a start bracket and an end bracket and then some values with commas. And we said it identity not const false and const true. So let's see if we load this one. It doesn't complain. All B to Bs. Well, okay, it says it's a list of functions. Functions are not very easy to print. So, but we can we can test them. We can do okay. Um, we can do function one. No, I got used that. So Boolean function one equals head of all B to Bs. I mean, it's the identity function, but uh, if we now check what B1 is, it's a function from bool to bool. I can apply it to false and I can apply it to true. So we can see it's the identity function, the function which returns its argument unchanged. So implicitly, uh, id x is defined to be x. So which so b1 of x is equal to id of x is equal to x. And uh, if I want to, I can index further into the list all b2b's at position 1. So this is actually head is the position 0. So if I load that one, then b2 is also a function from bool to bool. And b2 of false is true, and b2 of true is false. So it switches uh, around the false and true. And if we want to be complete here, I guess we should extract b4, 3 and b4 as well. Um, so b3 of false, b3 of true. Whatever I enter as an argument to b3, it always gives false. And b4, I can make a pair here as well, b4 of false and b4 of true. That's always true. So as you might notice here, a function from bool to bool is basically a pair of booleans. The boolean that we've chosen as the result of applying the function to false and the boolean we get by applying the function to true. So there are four of them. This also shows a rather useful thing in Haskell that you can have values as first class. You can create a list of functions. And I mean, it might be a good exercise uh, to say, to provide a list of all the functions of this type. We'll not do it here, but you mentioned things like and, whoops, and, or, well, dot, 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 <laughs> should be quite a few more. And it could be a good exercise to try to see, okay, what, what are these functions? What are all of these functions? How many are there and why? And how would you, uh, what would be the good notation for them? Oh, well, I, I should check here, I guess that, it's, it still is, is type correct. So the exercise, well, it's a list of functions. So I can apply exercise argument zero. That's a function which could be applied to false and true to get false and so on. Okay, that's illustrating a bit what you can do uh, in the interpreter with Haskell. Um, as I mentioned, if you're new to Haskell, there are three extra lectures on the, in the playlist already when you can look at the definition of functions like const and id and function composition and so on. Um, let's move a little further down. Here is an example of a function which is perhaps not very useful, but it's useful to illustrate a point. So the function g divides x by x. So if I apply g to 2.3, I will get 1. If I apply it to pi, I will get 1. If I apply it to anything within rounding errors, at least it will be 1, except what happens if I apply it to 0? 
Has anybody got a suggestion what might happen if I try to divide zero by zero? Yeah, error, the computer explodes, not a number. So the if I apply it G to zero here, it will say none, so not a number. So the thing is that um, there are different choices to be made here. I mean, usually you would say that division by zero is not allowed, but it would be rather inconvenient if the data type for real numbers, or actually in this case, floating point numbers, uh, would let the computer computation crash anytime anybody divided by zero. So what happens in actual reality is that uh, the designer of the data type for float and double have decided that, well, it, it contains lots of numbers, but it also contains some other symbolic representations of, for example, um, um, not a number, infinity, minus infinity, and so on. There is, a, there is a suggestion here that it should be nothing, that the only acceptable signature for division would be division takes, say, an int to an int to maybe an int. And this is, this is uh, it's fine. One, one can argue for that and one can try to work with it. It's just a little bit inconvenient in expressions, especially if in larger calculations, because um, usually you would, you would do simplifications um, when you do divisions and um, it's a bit irritating when the maybe gets in the way. Um, well, real divisions are, are um, have, have the same problem as division for integers and the fact that the division by zero is, is not very nice. But the, the pragmatic solution that's been chosen for the, what is called floating point numbers is that they just encoded a value for not a number, which is a little bit like an error. So if you, if you try to see what happens with this plus uh, seven or, or um, multiply by 17, it's, it's, uh, it's like an error, it, pro it progresses. Whatever you do with it, uh, it becomes, uh, it continues. And it even has some, some rather odd properties. I mean, if you say G of one and you check if that's equal to G of one, you would get true, which is not very surprising. But if you check g of zero, then you get false. So actually, none is not equal to none according to the standard for, for floating point uh, computations, which is a little bit confusing. So it really sort of works on this uh, abbreviation, not a number, in the saying that it's not a number, it's not even, it doesn't even care about laws like reflexivity of equality. Anyway, you can define these uh, doubles like one divided by zero, which is not, not a number. It is a number. So um, this inf here, it's actually infinity. It's, it's printed as infinity. And it also has rules. Uh, if you multiply it by four, for example, it's infinity. But if you apply, multiply it by minus four, it's minus infinity. And well, if you, if you square, uh, minus inf, you got plus infinity. So there are a number of these, these uh, evaluation rules which sort of work out. So it could be good to know. So this is one thing that the real numbers sort of, the, the, the closest approximation of the real number type. So this is a double is an approximation of the real number type. It can't quite be the real number type, but it's an approximation in two ways. Oh, yes, we infinite inf times zero, whoops, times zero is not a number. So that was a question in the chat, and that's correct. So you don't quite know how infinite uh, infinity is and how zero zero is, but the, that's why it ends up being a, um, not a number. So some things are, are nicely consistent here. They, they've been thinking quite a bit over 50 years ago about the standard for, for floating point arithmetics. Um, but uh, it, it can cause trouble. And uh, so what I say here is, for example, one of the properties which you should be aware of does not hold for approximations is associativity. So the way you place your parentheses when you do addition matters. 
So for example, here, I, I do addition in two different ways, x plus y plus c or x plus y plus c. So the addition happens first there or first here. And I call these two functions left-hand side and right-hand side. And then I want to check if I compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side for a certain triple of values, and I return the left, the right, the difference, and whether or not they're equal. So if I apply check as SOC to pi, 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 <laughs> well, then they happen to be equal. So regardless of the order you do these additions, it happens to be exactly equal, but not all numbers. So I think the simplest example I got for check a SOC is one, one, and a third. So here you may notice that here has this first number has a number of th threes and then a five in that position. And the other has a number of threes and not a five. And the difference, even though it's very small, it's 10 to the power of minus 16. So it has 15 zeros before the four, but still it is not equal. So if you really rely on exact equality, you should be very careful when you're using floating point values because they tend not to satisfy the laws. <laughs> well, IEEE 754 is the standard here. Uh, it says it's a mess. Well, it's, it's a clever mess. Uh, they got lots and lots of thought into making the as small approximations as possible, but definitely if you like laws like associativity and so on to hold, then you should be trying to avoid floating, floating point numbers. So of course, one way of checking, uh, one way of computing is, is to check with the rational numbers. So if you do the check a sock here, you notice that my check a sock function is polymorphic. So if I check what the type of check, oops, check a sock is, it says that for any type I can check equality for, and I have numeric operations, then it should work. So one example, I, I had above here the one 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 third. If I if I explain that this is actually a rash rational, then I end up with true instead. So associativity does hold for rational numbers. But there are trade-offs. If you work with rational numbers, then you can get very, very big uh, quote. Um, nominators and denominators. And for so things like the square root, you cannot do. It's provably, it's actually proven in the next chapter, I think next week, that the square root of two is not possible to express as any rational number. So you can never, and, and what, what uh, most computers do then is they, they sort of, they uh, take a double and make an approximation anyway. Um, okay. So these are expressions directly in the interpreter. Now I want to talk about modeling expressions. Um, so here, when, when talking about expressions, it's not always enough to talk about the values they get if we evaluate them. We also need to talk about simplifications and syntax. So the motivation here is perhaps you want to say that x times zero is equal to zero. So for all x, x times zero is equal to zero. And we may, may want to use that simplification in a big expression, something like uh, the square root of uh, something something and then times zero somewhere and then we want to just say ah oh, but anyway we don't have to compute this we can just evaluate it to zero so to be able to do simplifications like that we need access to the syntax the syntactic structure of the expression so this comes to what we were talking about in the other in the other file w1 um, what is a DSL? So I said it needs an abstract syntax, usually a recursive Haskell data type of syntax trees, a semantic type, and a function that computes the semantics from the syntax. So let's do that for very simple arithmetic expressions. So here we have three constructors for addition, 
multiplication and constants. So the interpretation here is that, uh, well, we can see some examples. One plus two times three would be presented by add the constant one to the multiplication of the constant two and the constant three. And the other parentheses order with a one plus two first, that would be the multiplication of the addition of the constant one and the constant two with the constant three. So uh, I think it's worth switching briefly over to uh, this um, Jamboard to illustrate uh, syntax trees. I think I should do that on my separate page. So let's move forward a bit. So the syntax trees here are trying to uh, Let's see which was the first, but one, one, the first one was one plus two times three. I'm adding in redundant parentheses is just to be extremely clear. So this is was the add constructor. And then I had the constant one, and then I had the mul constructor and the constant two and the constant three. And the reason I'm drawing this as a syntax tree is so just to look a little bit on the types here. So uh, this sub expression, the multiplication of two and three, that is also of that 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 is an expression of this. This whole thing is an expression of type E. So let's let's make some colorful circles here. So this thing. <laughs> is of type E, but also, so the red thing is of type E, but also the subtree is of type E. And if you go blue down here, also this is of type E. So we have a recursive data type with smaller and smaller syntax trees, but they are all of type E. And then at the very end, maybe I should use yet another color here. Uh, so the three down here is not of type E, not type E. The three there is a type integer. Uh, maybe I should write that out explicitly. This has type. Well, integer is too long to write, so I'll just write this Z. So the syntax tree is recursive, but it, it's the con constructor inserts these uh, external values into the syntax tree. OK, um, now if I want to evaluate this, I want to compute an integer out of this syntax tree. And I'll move back to the Haskell side. Um, then I'll say this is sort of the last, the fourth part of what the semantics is. I need to write a function from e to integer. And uh, this is the pattern I'm doing here. I've just added cases for the three constructors and the data type. And I've said that, well, we don't know quite what to do yet. And then I'll just start with saying something which is not correct. And that's x plus y. So why is this not correct? Oops. Well, it complains here that it couldn't match the expected type integer with the actual type e in the expression x plus y. So the thing is that x and y here, as I try to illustrate on the tablet are of type E. So X and Y have type E, not integer. So I, I cannot use normal addition on them. So what I can do is I can call eval on X and I can call eval recursively on Y. And those numbers, those, those results are integers. So let's see now. 
Now it didn't complain about the types and we can see if I can evaluate, well, expression one when it says, no, not really, because I haven't implemented mul yet. But now you see the pattern. Of course, I can uh, write the same thing here with multiplication. And I still can't compute it because the con case is not there. Uh, anyone having a suggestion for what the right hand side should be for the evaluation of the constant? Yes, C. So I already have the integer in the constant case. So I just have to return it. So now I can evaluate E1 to seven and I can evaluate E2 to nine. And I can evaluate larger express expressions like mal E2, mal E2, E2 as uh, nine to the power of three. <laughs> so this is an example of a very small DSL. So a domain specific language for would say polynomial expressions. So it has uh, addition, multiplication and constants. But if you really want to model say polynomials here, we really need an X as well. So what about variables? It's just down here. Let's start with adding one variable. Let's see what happens if we add an extra constructor, which we will just call X intended to model, oops, model polynomials. So you could say, well, polynomials, we should have, have X to the power of N, but let's just start with X because we can multiply X by X. So for example, let's, uh, let's make an E3 here. Uh, whoops, E3, that's mal XX. That's sort of X squared. So we don't really need uh, a special power to the power of a constructor in the data type if we just have X. Okay, now we, we can express uh, this E3 here, but we cannot evaluate it because I haven't added a case here. So eval of X is equal to, and now it's not quite obvious what we could do here. What should be the value of X? Any suggestions? Suggestion is we can take in a value for X. Yes, I, I don't think there is any other choice really. So um, instead of just returning an integer, so actually now let's introduce a type synonym. So we had before, uh, simple semantics was integer. And this was then simple sem. I just trying to do this so that we recognize, so we can also say type ab syn equals e. So then we have this pattern that will come many times in the course that in a value function takes an abstract syntax expression to a sum semantics. But now we need to move from the simple semantics to another fun semantics. So let's just call it sem here. And there was a suggestion of integer to integer. So what happens if we try to do that? Well, first of all, it will say parse error because I did something wrong somewhere. Uh, Yes, I, I never finished this one, error to do. Um, okay, and then it starts complaining about the, uh, the, the types. So the thing is now um, in trying to solve the X case, I've invalidated all the other cases, but let's, let's try to be, um, come back to that later and first see if we can fix the X case. So any suggestions on what the semantics of X should be here? What could we return, which has type integer to integer? Yeah, several suggestions are id. So let's see, whoops. Uh, well, that's type checks. 
So what does this mean? Well, another way of writing is to say that, well, eval of x given an actual value of x is x. So this is, I mean, these, these two versions are, ident are, are equivalent. So I can just put this one outside, but, but let's put this one as a perhaps more readable version. So if we have the sy symbolic uh, expression, capital X, and we've decided that we want to evaluate the expression with the value, uh, smaller case X, then we can return that X. Okay, what happens in the constant case then? Then this should also take an X as an argument, but yeah, constants don't change. Regardless what X value we need for, for this constructor, the constant C should still be C. Okay, so this still works. And then it's a question what to do in these cases. And here I want to do it um, in, in two stages. First, I want to say this said plus here. So some kind of addition is needed. So let's do X per or, or add E and mul E. So I, I will define my own function, add E and mul E. Um, but there, there's something, there's some mismatch here still. There's still an X argument missing. So, and, and I've used the X argument before. So I'll first have to re, re, replace them. But let's call X, the previous X E1 and the previous Y E2. It's also easier to remember that those are not numbers. And then we need the X as an extra argument. So here I'm claiming that it should be possible to get the result from evaluating E1 and then add that to the result of evaluating E2. What about scoping? E1 and E2 was used before. Yes, that's also true. Uh, so now it's an extra confusion that E1 here is the same name as E1 here. Um, it will not confuse Haskell because this one is actually hiding the out, out one, but it may confuse us. So let's go one step further and, and um, let's see, remain, rename those E1s to, um, well, I don't know, I mean A1 and then this E2 to A2, that is to A3. Okay, anyway, there, there are different solutions possible here. Um, yeah, now what he's complaining about is I haven't defined add E and mul E. So I definitely need to do that. And uh, mul E, and the first question is, what are the types of these operators? Let's first say add E is equal to error to do. And mul E equally. Well, my brain has just become mush. What was absin now again? Is it important? Well, absin here is defined as E. And E is a data type of syntax tree with four different constructors. Add, mul, con, and x. So I just renamed it to so see that this line is the same as I will write in many other lectures. So eval takes an abstract syntax to some semantics. It's not quite uh, correct everything yet, but uh, because we got type errors, but let's uh, wait and see if we can fix them. So what I would like to do, um, add e is type integer to integer. Yes, well, add e, should return. So if, if we try to see in the end, we should get some sem out. So whatever it does, it should return sem. And here as well. And it should take two things as input. And if if the if the right hand side should work as it is written now. Um, okay, let's see. Absun to sem is just e to integer integer. Yes. Currently, this type here 
is the same as integer to integer and epsilon is e so that's what it is it's actually taking two arguments the new eval an e and an integer and returning an integer and it, it doesn't quite work as it does now so uh, as an intermediate step here to get forward i will actually maybe confuse further by getting rid of the x on the left hand side so I can do that by returning to the id we said before. So eval of x is actually directly id. And we can write this as const c. So const c is const c. If we want to represent the constant c, we should always return the constant c. And then I can also remove the x's here. And then we have something which doesn't mention x, but it's still available somewhere in the background. So if we look at the types now, we can see that add e takes whatever eval e1 returns, which is something of type sem, and then another one of the same type, and then returns to sem. So it should actually have type sem to sem to sem, and the same here. So now we have something which is type correct. Of course, it still doesn't do anything because we've got lots of errors in here. But here I want to illustrate this kind of type driven development. So notice that sem and sem, they are two arguments. We could call them x and y, but I will call them f and g here. So f and g both have type sem. Sem is the same as integer, whoops, uh, press something wrong, integer arrow integers. So they are actually both functions. And why are they functions? Well, remember, we're trying to evaluate an expression which has an unknown x in it. So we already, always at the end need to fill in what this x is. So f and g are functions from integer to integer, and we need to return such a function. And I would write here, uh, anonymous function expression taking x as an argument. Okay, so here at the question mark point, I need an integer. So how do we get an integer? Well, of course we have an integer, we could return x, but that would be silly. That would be not using x and y, uh, f and g. So I will not do that. It has the right type, but it's not what we want to do. We want to add the, the functions f and g. And what we can do, we can apply f to x, and we can add the result to the application of g to x. So let's first check if this is type correct. And if add e of the identity function and the identity function, well, it says type semantics, so I, I can apply it to 7. And now it returns 14. So why is that? Well, it applies the first identity function to seven and then the second identity function to seven and it adds up the results and that's 14. And why is that so? Well, because if we would have add x, x, then we would like to get two times x, which is 14. So it seems reasonable. And then if, if this is now correct, then it should be pretty clear that this should be very similar. Sorry if this is a little bit fast at the end, but I'm trying to get two minutes left or five minutes left to introduce the other two assistants. But let's see if this is type correct. Yes, it is. And uh, I should be able now to evaluate X. Okay, it has type semantics. Well, I need to supply the small X, so the three. Okay, so if X is three, then eval X is also three. And if I have mol x x, then it's nine. And if I evaluate one of our test expressions, a1, well, actually, if you remember up here, uh, the test expression a1 did not use x. So whatever we will supply for x, it will not care. It will always return one plus two times three, which is seven. 
So to get more interesting expressions, we need to actually mention x somewhere. But as I said, mul x and then perhaps add x x. That should be 2x squared applied to 1 is 2. Applied to 2 is 8. Applied to 3 is 18 and so on. OK. So what I've shown here is that if we want to model expressions and we want to have an x inside, so expressions which can represent, for example, polynomials, the semantics will need to be changed from just one integer to function from integer to integer. And this means that E is not a, just a type of abstract syntax trees in general, it actually can represent simple functions, not only one argument, whoops, expressions. Okay, there's a question, what exactly is semantics? Well, the word semantics uh, is the same as meaning, so I would say perhaps a me meaning assigning function or something like that, a translator, translator from an abstract, whoops, abstract uninterpreted syntax to some meaningful value type the semantic type. And I think this is roughly what I said in, whoops, now I closed Emacs, that was not my intention. Um, here, uh, that the DSL has four components, the semantics at the end is a function from the abstract syntax to the semantics. Yeah, it's hocus pocus, maybe, but there is a whole chapter or a whole book about it. Um, and this particular example of introducing X uh, is in the book. It's gone through in a slightly different way, but basically very similar way. And I encourage you to read um, chapter one and, and uh, ask questions if you get into trouble there. And of course, also go to the exercise session, because now I think we should have in the room if I end the share, um, two TAs. Uh, if you are here, then you could uh, yes. let yourself be known. <laughs> the list is a little too long for me to search through. So we have, have um, in the in addition to Solrun, uh, we got two more assistants in the course. And uh, Felix is one of them, if you want to. Yes, can I just steal? Ah, yeah, I can steal the focus from you. Yes, yes. you can. Hi, everyone. I'm Felix Carobini. I'm a postdoc right now in the Logic and Types group. And I did my PhD in math, doing some something related to dependent types also. And uh, I worked in the industry as a software developer for almost two years and uh, did a couple of postdocs before this one. Oh, yeah. And I draw, enjoy dependently type programming, uh, but I don't have experience with Haskell so far. So not much. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. And I don't speak much Swedish, I'm afraid. So sorry for that. You have to talk in English with me. <laughs> OK, great. Thanks, uh, David. Right, uh, hello. I'm um, David Van. I'm a PhD student also in the um, Logic and Types group, and I studied uh, mathematics prior to this for my undergrad and masters. And yeah, I, I also enjoy dependently typed programming. 
We'll see if this will affect the course contents. <laughs> there might be some Agda creeping in here and there. I must admit that I also enjoy um, dependent type programming, even though the course is based on Haskell. Um, what is dependent type programming? I think we'll have to return to that question another time. I know that uh, all of those involved in the course know the answers and can help with that. And there are lots of interesting things online as well as tutorials. You should know that uh, Gothenburg is, is one of the strong international places in dependent type programming. We've been pioneers and implementers of a system called Agada for, for many years. So um, I think that's enough for now. Um, Thanks for coming to this first lecture. Notice that there is another Zoom link for the exercise session where Felix would go through uh, another example of an expression type and some other exercises and try to solve them slowly and clearly so that you can get all your questions answered. And um, then uh, do also check out the bonus exercises uh, that um, David will um, uh, be checking if you've solved on Friday. And um, otherwise, if you've got questions, ask in the Canvas uh, discussion list or so. Thank you. Bye.